All right, welcome back. Here's problem two. Uh, in this one, we have a cylindrical object that's being suspended from a ceiling by a string that's wrapped around it. Right. So this object has a moment of inertia of one half m r squared, and it's suspended up by a height of three r above the floor. All right, so uh, first question here, we're asked to find a, or make a free body diagram for this object showing uh, all of the forces that are acting on it. Uh, you're given a little figure like this. All right, so uh, there's going to be a gravitational force, which you should draw acting at the center of mass of the object. And then there is going to be an upward force of tension from the string, which is going to point like this. And there are no other forces acting on this. There's no objects contacting it. There's no uh, air resistance that we have to worry about. So this is it, just these two forces. And then in part B, we're asked to uh, determine the relative magnitude of these two forces. So are they equal, or is one of the are one of these forces greater than the other? Uh, so the answer to this question uh, can be determined by looking at how the object accelerates. Uh, obviously, when you let this object go, it's going to fall downward. So the center of mass will accelerate downward which means that the net force has to point downward, which means that the gravitational force is going to be greater than the tension in the rope. Okay, so part C, how we're going to start having to actually calculate things. Uh, so we're asked to derive an expression for the acceleration of the disk as it falls. So the first thing I will point out here before I go into any calculations is that we already know immediately uh, a range for our possible answers. So you should be able to convince yourself that A must be between two values. And those values are 0 and G. Obviously, it's not going to uh, accelerate in a uh, upward direction. So A is going to be positive if we make down our positive direction. And it cannot accelerate down uh, faster than the acceleration due to gravity because there's a, a tension force pulling it upward. So it's going to be somewhere between these two values. Okay, so to find out what that is, I'll write an equation uh, based on Newton's second law. If down is my positive direction, then when I determine my net force, that's going to be mg in the positive direction minus tension in the negative uh, upward direction. That's going to be equal to m times a. All right, uh, so this equation alone is not enough, but I can write another equation based on the rotation. That is the net torque equals the moment of inertia times alpha. So the net torque, uh, if we consider the torque around the center of mass, then gravity creates no torque, but the tension force will create a torque equal to the force multiplied by r, which is the lever arm distance. That's going to be equal to the moment of inertia, 1 half mr squared, times the angular acceleration. Well, angular acceleration here is going to equal the linear acceleration divided by r. So it turns out the rolling without slipping condition applies here as well, as long as the string remains uh, taut around the object as it falls. So this uh, simplifies to 1 half mra. Uh, I can divide both sides of this, equ this equation now by r and get that the tension force equals one-half mass times acceleration. If I plug that in over here, I can rearrange things and get mg equals three-halves ma, or the acceleration is equal to two-thirds g. So we do, in fact, get something that's between zero and g for the acceleration. All right, uh, this was actually just part one of part C. Uh, so the second part uh, asks us to derive an expression for the time that it takes this thing to reach the ground. Okay, so remember that the height that this thing has to fall through is 3r, and we can say that the uh, change in y is equal to 1 half times acceleration times delta t squared. All right, so the uh, change in the y position is 3r. It's going to equal 1 half times 2 thirds g times delta t squared. 
So if we cancel some things and simplify uh, 9r divided by g equals delta t squared. So delta t equals 3 times square root of r over g. All right, uh, lastly, we have a question about the rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so as this thing falls, it's going to convert gravitational potential energy into uh, kinetic energy. Actually, let me write it this way. Uh, but that kinetic energy involves uh, what we might call translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. All right, so the question is, uh, how do we figure out what fraction of that potential energy becomes rotational kinetic energy? Uh, there are a couple of ways we could do this. Uh, so on one hand, the total kinetic energy will be 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Uh, this first term, I'll just leave like this. Uh, the second term, I can rewrite in terms of our other parameters. So if I'll plug in 1 half mr squared for the moment of inertia. Omega is equal to v divided by r. So I got 1 half mv squared for the kinetic energy, and then 1 fourth mv squared for the rotational kinetic energy. So this is the rotational kinetic energy, and if you look at this, this is 1 third of the total kinetic energy. So we have a potential energy to start with of m times g times 3r. One third of that is going to be converted into rotational kinetic energy. So be it just mgr. All right, uh, let me show you an alternate way of doing this if uh, this seems a little too abstract. Uh, the other thing we can do is just figure out what omega actually is. We know the acceleration of this object is 2 thirds g, so we know the angular acceleration will be that divided by r. All right, so omega starts at zero, and it's going to increase at this rate. So in general, omega is equal to the initial velocity plus alpha times t. And we determined in part 2 that the time is equal to 3 times root r over g. So if we simplify this, we get 2 times the square root of g over r as our value for omega. If I take that and plug that into the formula for rotational kinetic energy, I'll need a little bit more room here. It's going to be 1 half times our moment of inertia, 1 half mr squared, multiplied by omega, which we just said was the square root of 2, sorry, 2 times the square root of g over r squared. If I multiply all of this out, uh, the coefficients all end up canceling. I have a 1 fourth out in front, and then I have 2 squared. So I'm just left with mr squared times g over r, or mgr, the same result we got the other way. All right, so there's one more part to this problem, which also involves calculus. Uh, this one has us uh, using calculus to determine the moment of inertia for just a, a small wedge that's cut out of this disk. All right, so let me pull up this picture here. All right, so we're given that the linear mass density of this object here is given by this function. Remember, we use lambda to represent linear mass density, so this is like mass per length. All right, so I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, the way we calculate moment of inertia for any arbitrarily shaped object is we have to perform an integral, and we are adding up r squared times dm. So basically what we're doing is we are cutting this object into very, very small slices that have mass dm, and we are multiplying that by 
r squared, where r is going to be the radius of motion for that particular slice. So for this wedge, we're going to imagine it rotating around this tip. So r will be the distance that we measure in this direction. Okay, so we need to figure out how to find the mass of a tiny slice of this wedge. And that is where this equation here is going to come in. This tells us the mass per unit length of a particular slice of this wedge. So the mass of this slice here is going to be the density times the thickness of the slice, which is our, the value dr. All right, so if we put all that together, uh, we're going to be performing an integral of r squared times dm, where, again, I'll write it out here, dm is equal to lambda times dr. So I'll plug that in. Lambda is this expression here, and then dr. And we need to integrate this over the entire wedge. So r is going to go from 0 to big R, which is the radius of the disk. All right, so to make this easier, I'm going to move all of my constants out in front. So make sure you don't get little r and big R confused here. Big R is a constant. It's the radius of the disk. Little r is our variable that changes as we move along this wedge. So I have an r squared and then another factor of r, so this becomes r cubed. The integral of r cubed is 1 fourth times r to the fourth. And I'm going to evaluate that between my limits of 0 and capital R. So if I do that, I get 1 fourth capital R to the fourth minus 0, so I can ignore that. And then I have R to the fourth divided by R squared, so that's going to be R squared. In the denominator, I have 25 times 4, which is 100. So this is the moment of inertia of just that tiny wedge. All right, and then the final part of this problem is just to find an expression for the rotational inertia of the disk that's been modified. So basically the disk minus this wedge. So the main idea here is that moments of inertia for objects will add and subtract just like the masses will. So we can say the moment of inertia of the full disk is equal to the moment of inertia of the wedge plus the moment of inertia of the modified disk. We know the moment of inertia of the complete disk is 1 half mr squared. Uh, the moment of inertia of the wedge, we just found was 1 one hundredth mr squared. And then this term here is what we are trying to find. All right, so this is just a simple subtraction. 1 half minus 1 one hundredth is 50 minus 1 over 100. So we get 49 over 100 mr squared as our final value. I guess if you want to be a little cute, you could write it as m times 7 tenths r squared as well. All right, so that should do it for uh, problem two. Stay tuned for one last video going over problem three.